So here we have a fabric and it's a two-dimensional fabric for all sense and purposes that is going to represent our space-time and our mass here is going to distort that fabric and in essence that is best summarizing Einstein's general theory of relativity which in essence says matter tells space-time how to curve and space-time tells matter how to move. Well let's demonstrate that. My mass in the center and of course it distorts it and my objects of mass will now accelerate towards the center as a result of the fact that the distortion causes it to move. Now that gives us a specific acceleration. If I add another mass, so we've got twice the mass now, then obviously my particles will accelerate at a greater rate. Matter tells space-time how to curve and space-time tells matter how to move. The curvature of space-time is causing the acceleration. Now, what happens if I now have an object moving at a velocity? Now, obviously, if it's moving fast enough, its path will be distorted. It will not travel in a straight line from our perspective, but will be curving around it. And off it goes, and so we can escape. If you were on that surface as a two-dimensional figure, you would be experiencing straight line motion. But from our perspective, we would see that there is a curve going in. And in fact, that path is the shortest path from A to B along that curve. But what if we slow things down? Can we make it go into orbit? A couple of things you should notice there. First of all, it, if it goes into some sort of orbit, and generally it'd be an elliptical orbit, but if it's at the right speed, we might get a nice circular orbit. The essence is, is that the further it is, the slower it moves. It has also a longer period, and so that models Kepler's third law, as well as Newton's law of gravitation, at least the description of, of how the objects move. And clearly, as it moves closer, the orbital period is definitely shorter and it moves a lot faster. Another thing I can demonstrate is how I can distort the spacetime with two masses and I can maybe cause an object to orbit around it in a terms of a figure eight. Now it takes a little bit of practice, but in essence, this is what we're going to do. I'm gonna move this mass a bit closer over here. I'm gonna put that mass a little bit further over there. And let's see if we can get a figure eight going around. Now, one of the other things you can demonstrate is why do all the planets move around the sun in the same direction? Why is there a preferred sense of direction? Well, let's have a look at this and let's model the early solar system where we have objects traveling in opposite directions around the sun. So what you can see is that due to the collisions, eventually you'll have a preferential direction. And that is usually dependent also, apart not only from the collisions, but also how much matter is moving in one direction compared to the amount of matter moving in the other direction. Now, there are of course some important limitations to this model, and that's really important to appreciate the strengths but also the limitations of models. Now, the strength of a model is when it satisfies a key concept in explaining that particular key concept that may actually be quite abstract. And in this case, the distortion of space-time can be modeled by a distortion of our latex sheet. Another strength, it's simple, it has visual power, and it gives you an intuition of the understanding of space-time. But there are limitations. Now, the first one is an obvious one. That is, our balls will move across this and will experience friction. That is, they're gonna lose energy and so they spiral in and eventually stop. In reality, of course, planets around stars, moons around planets, and of course, the stars around the center of our galaxy don't experience any friction for all intents and purposes. And so therefore, if they are in elliptical orbits, or even better, in circular orbits, their total mechanical energy, that is the gravitational and kinetic energy, remains constant. However, there are other important considerations. The surface is supposed to represent four-dimensional space-time. That is, the three dimensions of space plus the dimension of time. And we have here only a two-dimensional surface. Now, the thing is, is that this particular model uses gravity to work. And in essence, that's not the case in reality. We don't have some external force applying it to that 
causes the objects to accelerate around a central body. So that's our first limitation. Gravity is not needed for spacetime to curve. Secondly, the fact that this is representing a two-dimensional model, the fact that it's being pulled down suggests that there is a third dimension in space that we can't appreciate, as if there's some fourth dimension of space or distance that we can't appreciate as three-dimensional beings. And again, that's not the case. This is actually representing a two-dimensional space, but the space aspect of space-time is still the three dimensions that we are normally associate with. And so there isn't a fourth space dimension. But critically, our third aspect is that this does not show the distortion in terms of time. Space-time distortion is the distortion of space and time. And so this particular model does not show the distortion of time. And in fact, much of how we describe gravity is due to the distortion of time. And so the closer you are in, the slower the time travels, the further you are out, the faster the time travels. And that's represented well in the great movie from 2014, Interstellar, that at different distances, you're going to have different passages of time. So although this model is a fantastic model to give you an intuition of gravitation, it's important to understand the limitations that it also poses. Finally, I want to encourage you that if you want to dig deeper into this whole understanding, I encourage you to read this particular book, Teaching Einsteinian Physics in Schools, written by David Blair and Magdalena Kirsting. And I encourage you also to look up Magdalena Kirsting, who's written numerous articles on the limitations of this model, and David Blair, who runs the Einstein First program that is based in Western Australia. I encourage you, this is a good read, and I encourage you to look up those two particular authors to get you a deeper understanding of space-time. I hope that has helped you understand space-time a little bit better and encourage you to make your own, whether you are a student or whether you are an educator, to help you teach the concepts of gravity in a more Einsteinian way. Now, please remember to like, share and subscribe. Put a comment down below if you want to continue the discussion. And by all means, if you feel inclined, buy me a coffee and support the work that I do. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care and bye for now. So how do you make one of these space-time simulators? Now, this is not my own design. The credit goes to Dan Burns, who from Northern California published a video 10 years ago on a very similar design. But considering that I have an Australian audience, I thought I'd show you how I made it and hopefully that will help you in making your own. The first thing you'll need is some PVC pipe. Now I've got here some pressure pipe PVC, it's 20 mil, and you'll need about six meters of it. Now that's gonna determine how high this sits. So in my case, I've actually reduced it to 70 centimeters by simply cutting it off with a pipe cutter or a uh, angle grinder that you can get a nice cut or a hacksaw, whatever you want to use. Now the next thing you need is some electrical conduit and you will need about 12 meters of it. You're basically gonna produce 12 one meter sections, six for the top and six for the bottom. And the reason why we use electrical conduit is it because it has some flex to it. Then what you will also need is a T-junction. Now this T-junction here allows you to connect all the parts up. And so that simply sits on top like that so that you have one of these at the top and you also have one on the bottom. And as you can see here, I have them already made up and I simply glued them together. Now, how are you gonna connect it all up? Well, here you can see I have my connector and in my initial idea, I just had my sections of pipe just passing straight through like so. And so I was able to connect it up that way, but I found that troublesome, it moved. And so I needed to find a way to fix that in there, but you'll see that it slides right there. So how do I do that? Well, what I did is I created my own little plug. And in this case, what I have here is a 20 to 15 mil reducer or pressure reducer, and that will fit very nicely, I found, on my PVC pipe. Now, it's a little bit tight, but it actually fits really nicely. But then I need to connect it to my T-junction. So what I did was I cut a small section of 20 mil PVC pipe, and I placed it into that section, and I now have a joint that sits in and goes in nice and neatly like so. And so that's your connection that you have. Now, one other thing I did in making the frame to make it easy, because although the electrical conduit does bend, I found that the pressure at the joints 
caused it to sometimes actually pop out. And so what I did was I used a heat gun and then bent it carefully to a, a desired curvature like so. And you can see what I have joined, in this case, two of my little connectors already up and I've used some tape here to hold them into place. The reason I don't glue them is that I can actually adjust them initially as I put them together before I tape them up. And so now as you can see I have here my connectors and you'll see I created all together 24 of these to connect up to my 12 tubes over here and then of course once you have your frame you're needing the fabric and of course in this case what I have here is some lycra. Now when you buy lycra at the uh, material store make sure you look for the nylon spandex material. Why? Well first of all it's full waist stretch so that's what you want and secondly usually the amount of spandex in that material is up to 15 to 20 percent whereas your cotton lycra or cotton spandex material may only have five percent of the spandex in there. So look at for the nylon spandex with the higher amount of spandex to give you that stretchability that you need in the fabric. Then of course what you also need is some clips which is you're going to be using to clip the fabric on and uh, lastly you'll need some weights in this case I've got some kilogram weights and 500 gram weights which are going to be our center of masses and of course lastly our marbles. So let's put it together. So there's my frame put together. I'm just gonna make sure we are nice and tight all the way around. And now of course we need to put on the material. Now I purchased, in this case, 1.5 by two meters, which is heaps. And the trick here is, is to start at your narrower sections first and then just work your way around So as you can see it's now roughly done and all you need to now do is just check the tautness so that you get a good surface. Now it's fairly forgiving so you can probably tighten things up so that you get a nice smooth surface. And all we've got to do now of course is test it. So I've got 1.25 kilogram mass in the centre. And works just fine. 